Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Director's Hour. I am Fred Landman. I am the CEO of Stellenbosch Graduate uh, Institute. Uh, for the newcomers, let me just introduce the idea of the platform. It is brought to you by Stellenbosch uh, Graduate Institute, an online business school, and with uh, in collaboration with our partners, Fluid Rock. They are our expert partners and they are a leading independent governance firm. This is specifically for directors and executives. And once a month, we discuss, deal with a topic deemed to be uh, of relevance to this particular uh, audience. Now, today's topic is uh, around vaccination and especially mandatory vaccination. And it revolves around the public debate on this, uh, on this area. Uh, now, you would have appreciation for that, that this is an immensely uh, complex and highly emotive issue, which started off with a pandemic, driving a debate on uh, decision-making around lives and livelihoods, and of course, then lockdown or not lockdown, or how much of that, uh, that and with a number of uh, debates, smaller debates in between, and then it escalated to vaccination, vaccinating or not vaccinating with a plethora of perspectives uh, on that spectrum. And now we are sitting in an environment we are talking about mandatory vaccination or not. So the purpose of today is not to be definitive on this debate. Uh, but to assist uh, our audience, uh, our executives and our boards in creating a perspective uh, on how to deal with this problematic. And I'm using the word problematic because it's a, it is a system of problems. It's like a bowl of fish hooks. If you pull on one, there are a number of other fishing, uh, fish hooks that, uh, that move in, in that space. So given the nature of this subject, there is no way that we can deal with all of it in the hour given to us. And truth be told, there is no definitive formula uh, to be to be revealed in this process. So we will not dwell necessarily on the on the legal and the theory of law, etc. Although we will bump against it, and we will inevitably have to have a, an opinion to this side or that side around it. And we will restrict ourselves as best as we can uh, to to governance and to ethics. So to do this. Uh, we have put a panel together of three experts that are joining us today. Uh, the, uh, one of the members of our uh, panel is Harry Pretorius. He is the head of compliance uh, at Fluid Rock. And uh, Harry is a, uh, an admitted attorney and a notary public. He is an expert around compliance uh, uh, and ethics. He is a compliance, a professional compliance. Um, He's a certified compliance uh, officer and he's also an ethics professor, uh, officer and he's got, uh, he's got experience in multiple uh, organizations and uh, really knows his way around these topics. Then we have Mohammed Adam. He is an admitted attorney, also holds an LM, uh, LLM from the University of Essex in the UK and there's some resonance with the, with the, with the other member of our panel there. Uh, he's been a member of King Committee and Corporate Governance and uh, he's currently General Counsel and GM Regulation at ArcelorMittal in South Africa. And he was also, until recently, I think 2020, uh, 2019, he was the Chair of the Board of Directors at the Ethics Institute of uh, uh, here in, in, in South Africa. Then our guest from the from the UK is uh, Harry um, Kenneth uh, uh, Underhill. He's from the UK and he's the founder and the director of ICSR, Implement Compliance Solutions and Resources. It's a consultancy uh, providing services in the insurance market. Kenneth has over 25 years of experience in that insurance environment in London. He's a director of multiple companies and intermediaries operating in more than 30 countries in EMEA. Uh, and he's working uh, specifically very closely to local directors uh, and others in operations, compliance and risk uh, and HR. And then with the purpose of really 
delivering good governance uh, within those businesses. These are my three guests for the day. And to start off, I will ask Harry to provide us some background from a policy uh, perspective, uh, as where that is where the board will have to apply its mind and where the decisions uh, have to find uh, their place. Harry, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, Frick, as well as my, my, my uh, co-panelists, as well as all the attendees. Thank you very much for making time to to, to, to join us on this very eloquent topic. And as uh, Frick very eloquently introduced everyone, is I'm privileged to be in your presence. This is um, just, uh, Frick, can you just quickly confirm that you can uh, see my screen? I can see your screen, Harry. Okay, so... Without uh, further ado, let's jump into it. Is a uh, Fluid Rock Governance Group is uh, proposing that uh, it's not the mandatory poli uh, a policy. Um, we'll delve, delve into that a little bit deeper. But many employers are currently asking, do we need a vaccine policy? What does the legislation say? Mandatory versus voluntary. What are the rights of employees? Was even all the go, there's a lot of been restrictions in terms of movement and all of that. Is the employee still does have rights? And what are employers' rights as well as overall arching? What's what's their responsibilities? Then the five top reasons for having a vaccine policy is its clarity of rules and regulations. It's to create the safe and emotional physical space, balance the employees' rights and responsibilities, understand the rights and the duties of the employer, and then ultimately de-risk your organization. There's a global approach towards vaccination. And sadly enough, by the look and sound of things, is even although COVID only originated in 2019, is we're in it for the long haul. Is high level, I'll just briefly touch on a couple of the countries that's been highlighted. In Italy, all health workers, including pharmacists, are obliged to show either proof of vaccination or a negative test or a recent recovery from a infection. And workers failing to show a valid health certificate will be suspended without pay, but may not be fired. And there's currently no mandatory green pass uh, required for employees in the in Italy. In the US, it's also a very, very um, uh, uh, the much debated topic. Is the the, the government is uh, is in the process of mandating? Uh, they they uh, recently announced a COVID mandate, where all employers with more than 100 workers would have to require their workers to be vaccinated or under, undergo at least a weekly COVID-19 testing. And employers that don't comply with those requirements can face uh, fines of up to $14,000, apparently according to the Biden administration. And currently there's no final decision as to whether or not foreign visitors may need to be vaccinated. Then in Australia, there's uh, mandatory vaccinations for high-risk aged care workers as well as employees in quarantine hotels and in Britain there's mandatory vaccinations for care home workers for, from October and then there's also proof of vaccination required by patrons at nightclubs and other venues with large crowds and then in France is the president Emmanuel Macron uh, on, on in July uh, made it mandatory for all health workers to be vaccinated as well as a proof of vaccination or coronavirus negative test will be need to be produced by individuals who want to enter a cinema or want to board a train. And then in Canada, there's mandatory vaccinations of patrons of non-essential businesses, such as restaurants, as well as movie theaters. Um, the local approach at the moment is, is very much, is, is as, you, as everyone is aware of the press, in the press, in the popular press, of the, the, the approach taken by Discovery versus the take, uh, approach taken by Momentum. Discovery said there's a mandatory vaccine policy that they're going to implement from January next year. And Momentum said um, they would much rather follow the voluntary process pertaining to that. They're not going to force anyone to take the vaccine. Every employer must conduct, conduct a risk assessment to determine if a mandatory vaccine policy is required or not. And then obviously there are certain exclusions. Uh, so, for example, employers with less than 10 employees only need to comply with the uh, normal directive, uh, directive 12, which is PPE and the social distancing. And then mines and mining areas is currently excluded as well, as well as then various shipping and floating cranes, uh, uh, the, the sector. Um, our approach currently rests on high level on six pillars. It's business planning, it's commercial implications, the potential li legal liability, 
And then ultimately also it's contained in the di directive directions uh, that's been issued by the department. Mutual respect between the employees and the employer and then managing the choices of employees refusing vaccination and then conflict uh, resolution management. Uh, we've got a three phase approach we, 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 where we can advise and guide you through the risk assessment, identify the, the relevant employees with a high risk comorbidities and all of that, and then the policy and plan. So in terms of the step one of the risk assessment, the operational requirements that needs to be considered would be obviously the business sector. If there's regular contact with public as well as with co co-workers, the congregation of employees, as well as the workplace setup. Um, the, employer, the employers must identify employees who are at high risk of transmission of the virus through their work and all the, those employees who are vulnerable. And then high risk employees include employees who are regularly interact with the public. So, for example, a receptionist, a doctor, a nurse, a sales representative, waiters, hotel many uh, employees and all of that. And then vulnerable employees are currently defined in terms of the, uh, the, the directions as anyone over the age of 60. Um, in any known or disclosed health issues of comorbidities, medical conditions, chronic lung diseases, diabetes, severe heart conditions, moderate se severe hypertension, and then pregnancy if you're uh, more than 28 weeks pregnant. And then also the step three is to develop the plan and the policy. There's the measures for the return to phase to return to work. And obviously, we are still in the process of remote working with PPE, social distancing, sanitizers, and disinfectants. And then there's measures for uh, vaccinating identified employees. You need to provide for transportation, paid time off, refusal for vaccination, benefits of vaccination, and then the nature and risk of severe side effects and allergies, alternative uh, options, as well as education and awareness on the COVID-19. So obligations of an employer towards the employees. Um, then something that also needs to be considered. So this is not a copy and paste one size fits all approach, as you can see. There's the rights of the employees needs to be uh, needs to be considered. Uh, the employees have got a right to refuse vaccination. They also have the right to consult the medical professional, health and safety uh, representative or worker representative, as well as a trade union. And then there must be certain incentives for the vaccination. So potentially additional paid leave or company vouchers or additional and then there's additional compliance measures required for uh, employers with more than 50 employees. And this is high level the, 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 the look of, a, of a, 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 a typical vaccination policy uh, would be the, the statement, the scope, the accountability, the responsibilities, the employees rights and then well as reporting. But as you as Frick very eloquently started off, this is not a a, a very simple, simple process. So it, there's lots of moving parts. I think his, 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 his um, analogy of the uh, a ball of fish hooks is probably the, the best I've heard thus far. So there's various le uh, legislation that also needs to be considered by an employer that that wants to institute a, a vaccine policy, um, as well as ultimately the public policy also needs to be considered. Um, we are able to advise and assist organizations with their approach to vaccine policies. It needs to be practical application of the legislation. It must be fit for purpose and it must be catered for company specific. So it's not a one size fits all. And then um, Frick, I'll pass it back to you. Let's discuss. Thank, thank you, Harry, for that background. Kenneth, uh, having heard what uh, Harry has just said in that background of the uh, of the policy. Uh, do you want to share with us in brief? I mean, you are you've got experience in the UK, Australia, EMEA, etc. What, what is happening in your part of the world, and how do you face these dilemmas? Uh, how's this problematic unfolding in your in your world? So, so, so the, the I mean, Harry kindly pointed out what's going on in a number of countries. What we what we don't see in the UK or Australia are mandatory requirements for uh, risk assessments and the like. Um, what you do have uh, is um, uh, you have uh, health and safety legislation which would expect firms uh, to undertake risk assessments. Uh, you have regulated entities like banks and insurers 
uh, which are required to continually assess the risks that those firms uh, are presented with and to act to protect um, you know, the firm itself uh, from those risks, um, but also it, its customers. Um, so, so, so the, the risks posed to uh, different firms in different countries uh, vary quite considerably because the, the laws are different. So the legal environment uh, in each different um, in each different jurisdiction, you're going to have uh, duties and responsibilities to employees uh, are different. Um, the uh, employment laws uh, as to what you how you have to treat your employees and what you uh, duties you owe them there are, are different. Um, privacy laws are different. Um, you know, uh, data protection laws are different, um, and and legal liabilities um, to third parties are are different. Uh, and that's actually the one. So if you're if you're considering what you need to do in a risk assessment, certainly in the UK and Australia, you should be you know undertaking some form of risk assessment to your business. The thing that will drive that most. Uh, is uh, from what I have seen it is is the legal liability to third parties um, more so possibly than and it seems to be overruling the the need to um, uh, the duties to your employees in some cases the contractual obligations that exist um, so outside of the legal environment and that question there as to which which is a stronger risk factor your employee risks or your third party customer risks, um, you also have the regulatory environment. Um, you, you know, there are firms here uh, that um, in, in the UK at least, who where the directors could be personally liable if they don't get um, things right. Um, certainly in the regulated, in, um, uh, regulated environment, so financial services, but equally healthcare, aged care and the like. Um, and each of those have different legal liabilities, um, you know, and the way that they interact with their customers is different. So uh, again, Harry talked about, you know, uh, uh, that question of how do you interact with your customers? If you're dealing with them, you know, on the internet, um, by email and the things, it, there's a very different approach. Uh, and your, your, your uh, duties and responsibilities to your employees would probably take over. But if you are dealing face to face with customers, then one suggests that perhaps customers are, are going to end up being potentially more important. Um, but the risk mitigations you may put in place will also protect your employees. Um, and, and there's something that hasn't been mentioned, but I think we probably do need to discuss. It's reputation. Um, reputation risk is a very significant risk and firms that get their position wrong um, could find their reputation damaged. Uh, and I think we need to, you know, in a discussion about governance and and um, and risk, reputation is, has got to be up there, particularly on the ethical side. Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth, would that be reputation in terms of how you deal with your employees or how you deal with your clients or both? Well, absolutely both. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you an example. Um, there's a firm here called uh, Pimlico Plumbing, uh, and it's a very large um, plumbing firm. Uh, and Pimlico Plumbing um, came out very early on and said, we are going to mandate vaccinations. Uh, and the and the very obvious reason for that was that they have people going into people's homes. They have people going into care homes, aged homes, uh, hospitals, uh, and and they needed to protect their customers, particularly the vulnerable customers. And so they came to the conclusion that it was customers over employees. But actually, getting their employees double vaxxed is a secondary reason for, for for the policy because it protects the customers when they go to sorry protects the employees when they go to customers' homes. Now the outcome of that decision and and it it took some time for them to implement it, um, but the outcome of that decision has been a, an increase in the firm's reputation uh, and an increase in business um, because people know that Pimlico Plumbing. Uh, have people who are vaccinated and they know and can feel safe as a customer if they need a plumber. 
Mohammed, you, you are you. Uh, maybe this is a good time for you to uh, to bring you into the conversation. Well, hearing this and what Harry and and Kenneth is saying, what is it that the board of directors need to take into account in assessing uh, whether the board requires a COVID nineteen risk assessment and policy? I know that King Four states that we must apply our minds, but what does this mean for assessment and for and for policy? Uh, thank you, Fripp, and good morning and good afternoon, good evening to, to all the participants. Thank you for inviting me to this session. So, Brick, if I can just start with the point you've just made about uh, corporate governance and the issue of King 4. So, um, I, I think this is universally applicable, but if you start with South Africa and when King 4 was being drafted, there was a lot of issues around more guidance on issues, uh, you know, uh, better clarity, you know, more formulas. And, and what we try to do with King4 is to say that in terms of governance and leadership, it's about applying your mind and then you have good judgment and good decisions. And you'll see the way King4 is framed. It's around apply and explain. It's around the principles. Uh, you'll see some examples between King3 and King4 where we moved things from uh, you know, giving a guidance guideline that says independent directors are those who meet the following criteria. If you look at King 4 today, it says board, apply your mind as to whether directors are independent and here's some guidance that you must think about. So that's my starting point to say that if you look at the issue of mandatory vaccinations, it's, it's the quintessential test case for me in terms of how boards will apply good governance. Because if you look at what we're dealing with, um, firstly, we have, and, and I know a lot of people will, will lean towards one or the other view about whether it's necessary given the risks they see, but there's no right or wrong answer to start with. Um, we have a regulatory framework, which is quite enabling. If you look from the constitutional rights of employees, uh, it, it's about balance and circumstances where you can limit those rights. If you look at the regulations that are in place, again, it's you can have such a policy subject to respecting the rights of employees. If you look at the National Health Act, um, you know, you need consent, but you can uh, do without, do away with consent in certain circumstances where there's a public health risk. And, and similarly with the occupational health safety legislation, it's about creating a, a safe working environment for employees. So unfortunately, it's not as easy as go and get some legal advice and here's an answer. What for the first time the legal framework is also saying is, yes, some param parameters within which you must work, but please apply your mind and decide how you make these trade-offs. And what boards are, need to then address is the trade-off between the public health imperatives, the constitutional rights of employees, and then the operational requirements of the business, which of course, as Kenneth points out, will also be impacted by risk to customers and what sort of exposure and liability do you know does the company uh, uh, you know uh, create for customers who deal with your your employees so having said that if you look at what's been happening um, in south africa against the legislative framework so firstly there's an obligation to do the risk assessment and then thereafter you need to develop a plan uh, you need to consult with labor and then you need to make the plan available. And where, where the legislation or, or, or the right directive is enabling, it says you can decide if you want to have a mandatory vaccination mm -hmm. policy. And that, you know, you put in your plan and you decide why and what, you know, what you want to do. If you look at what's been happening and, you know, what boards need to look at, it is these critical areas. So first, if you start with um, operational issues, you have examples, um, it was recently reported, Cathay Pacific, for example, uh, established a mandatory vaccination policy and said, you know, flight attendants who refused to be vaccinated, uh, you know, their employment could be reviewed. They had a very, very, well, I think what seems to be a reasonable reason in saying that, you know, if they fly internationally, if other countries do not allow staff in who are not vaccinated, it's a problem for them operationally, you know, how, how do they and do that aside from the issue of dealing with customers and the risk that, that ex, um, exposes people to. If you look at uh, in our situation when we looked at the issue, uh, and, and this is the other thing boards will need to look at is, I don't think you can look at your business as a whole. 
you may need to start separating it and look at the different risks that mm -hmm. different parts of the business are exposed to. So you have people who can work from home and, and maybe that's one policy that you can implement and you avoid certain risks. In an environment like ours where you have an operational environment, you then need people to come to the factory floor. And then it's an examination about what is that environment? Can you social distance? What is the risk of transmissions you know, spreading in that environment? We have what you call control rooms, which are quite small, and you have a few people working together in the control rooms. So the first thing is about safety of the employees and if the virus spreads. The second thing is if these operators who are crucial to the business all start getting ill, how do you run your business? And what do you do yeah. about them? Uh, I mean, some yeah. of the issues you, you know that you need to think about is what's the prevalence of infections in the business? Where is it coming from? Is it employee spread? Is it coming from outside? And that will dictate a little bit about what you need to do. But I want to touch on another aspect that's come through some of the decisions some of the companies have been taking recently, and that is the issue of social responsibility. So a number of companies, if you look at Discovery, for example, and, and the chief executive put out a very good letter setting out the reasons why Discovery has adopted the stance they, they've adopted. One of the first things he says is um, that people are dying and there's a need to stop it. And with a mandatory vaccination policy as a country, he believes we can save you know, 30,000 lives just by doing that. So that's another dimension that I think some of the boards and some of the leaders may need to think about in terms of, is this a legitimate consideration? And you know, if so, how do we do it? And then you match your operational requirements, safety of employees, but you add another dimension, which is slightly different from the issue of customers because I put customers with your operational requirements. This is just saying in the for the general good of the economy to get our economy going, we believe this is a good good policy. And there may be debates both ways about how you know how much you can extend and is that a good enough reason to actually have a mandate policy. Um, if I can stop there for a moment, because yeah. there are a number of issues I wanted to touch on about how the boards go about this and what information you believe. But let, yeah. let me just stop there for a moment. Well, I, mean, so, so I think is, is you've very eloquently touched on that and then explained that. And as you said, also the element of social responsibility and what Kenneth mentioned earlier is also the reputational risk or the re reputation. And uh, something that I just want to quickly just highlight, it is important to note is even if a company uh, do decide to have a policy just, uh, uh, just by stating that we're not going to have a policy, we're not going to mandate, uh, make it mandatory for our employees, it's also um, important to note that you can have a mandatory provision for a certain sector of your employees if it's deemed from an operational and a, and, 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 and a business perspective to be, to be imperative. So you don't need to have a blanket catch-all type of policy either. So can I, can I ask you, gentlemen, because it's one of the questions that are coming up on the side here, and I don't want to deviate because I think we've got a nice momentum in the conversation here. But uh, these are businesses and they have considerations. Would it apply exactly the same to an academic institution? I'm thinking of a traditional university. Uh, what, what should they consider in, in, in the context of what you've just shared with us? Um, I, I think that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think it is slightly different. Um, I, I think with educational institutions, it's not something that um, an institution should come to a conclusion on uh, in the sense of do we uh, mandate vaccinations for students because I don't think they actually can. I think that that is one of the questions that the government has to decide rather than an institution. Uh, I, think, I think educational institutions have different ways of looking at the risk um, and, and that is do they have classes where people attend? Um, or do they say, right, we have students who are living on campus. Um, how do we treat them differently to students that walk to campus or take the bus to campus every day? Um, yeah. You know, I, I think I think the policy decision for a for 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 an educational institution is is not one for them to take in terms of is this the right thing to do? I think that's something that a government must must do. Mm. Um, 
Mohammed, <laughs> you have a view on that. The, the first point I wanted to highlight, and you know, just to conclude what I said earlier, is because of the need to be mindful and apply yourself as leadership to what suits the needs and the requirements and the risks of your particular organization. I mean, it's, it's very good to have reference and regard for what others are doing, but unfortunately, you're not going to be able to just apply that. So the fact that Sanlam has made a decision or Discovery has made a decision one way or the other is, is almost irrelevant. It's interesting and important information to have regard to, but it's not a cookie cutter. You can't just apply it to your institution. The point I wanted to make about learning institutions. So let, let's start with the principles of governance and forget for a moment whether it's a business or any other institution. I'm saying there are leaders there who are sitting in a leadership position who have steward, stewardship over an organization and we're faced with a major issue. They need to apply their minds and say, I have a responsibility to make sure that this organization continues and is sustainable. I have an obligation to employees. I have an obligation to customers and, you know, what do I think, given the risks we're facing, needs to happen? Now, I think Kenneth is right. You may get to a conclusion where that leadership says, you know, some of this is not within our control. We need to go and lobby. We need to ask government. We need help for some sort of policy to put in place to help stem this problem or this risk that we see before us. But to the extent that they have control over certain decisions, I think they're no different from any other business. That leadership needs to then apply itself and say, well, what can I do given the risk I foresee? And this, that risk may be social distancing, uh, remote learning, alternatively mandatory vaccination, whatever it may be. Of course, there are legal issues about what their powers are and how far they can go and when do you need government. But all I'm suggesting is even in that instance, if I say the governing body or leadership needs to apply its mind and say, what do I need to do as leadership? to ensure the sustainability of this organization and act in the best interest of this organization. And if I can put certain things in place, I should do so. What are those things? Well, you need to get information, get up to speed, understand what the science says and what needs to be done, and then you can make a decision about what needs to be done. So, so on that on that point, uh, if we can get to practice, uh, we have referred to, uh, to Sanlam and, and we have referred to the discovery. So, Mohammed, you, you're sitting with uh, Arsenal Mittal. Um, what's, what's your approach there? Would you mind share with us what's your approach there? How did you deal with this? Uh, can we learn from that? Um, generally, the direction we followed is uh, in line with a, a lot of the business associations a while ago that said, you know, as, as the starting point, let's focus on education, communication, uh, and let that be the primary focus. Uh, we, we said we needed to then, uh, we, we consulted at the time, and we also said we needed to monitor this and review it on an ongoing basis. Uh, and that, that's where we were previously. I think a few things have changed since then. Um, you know, I think it's a lot more clearer around how much uh, vaccination hesitancy there is, which wasn't clear previously around that. Uh, I think there's a, a lot more clarity in terms of the regulations that have come out in terms of what employers can or cannot do. Uh, and what we've got a very sharp focus on is those vulnerable areas or those critical workspaces where we're saying we need to monitor that almost on a daily basis. And if, if the situation develops to a point where it's of concern, that we may need to then take appropriate steps. Uh, and that's where we've been. That's the decision we've taken. But of course, that decision is up for review, and uh, it may change going forward. Yeah, I, I, Mohammed, is, I, I agree that that is the prudent approach to take because, sadly enough, the situation is so fluid, and it changes almost on an hourly basis from a global, local, regulatory, research perspective. So to 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 ever be all and end all policy that's cast in stone and concrete, I, I think is not is not the, uh, the correct approach. So absolutely, I, I, I do agree with you that it should be managed proactively um, on a, almost on a daily basis. Harry, uh, if one em uh, employs such a policy, etc., what, what implications are here for the existing employee contracts? 
I'm personally of the opinion none, because it's, it's, it's as Muhammad said, it's you, you can't just unilaterally enforce something like that. I, I do believe it must be a collaborative, uh, 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 almost conversation between the employer and, and employees. And, it, uh, it's, and, uh, and, and also the view is, is for the, the best of the collective, not, not, there's no I in team. In, in many in many countries, you, you couldn't actually unilaterally impose something like this. There is a, an implicit um, term in contracts of, of employment in the UK, for example, that employees must do, you know, follow employers' reasonable instructions. Um, but at the same time, something like this is much more likely to be considered to be a change in the terms of a contract, which would require um, mass consultation with staff. So, so can I, we, we, we have limited time and there's just a number of questions opening up here, but can I move to a more, uh, maybe a sensitive area? And that's the whole uh, issue around, sh should there be incentives for employees to be vaccinated? But then also on the flip side, uh, if, if people don't take up those incentives, are there penalties? Are there costs involved there for, for non-compliance? Uh, um, Give me some perspective on this on this on this question on this dilemma. I think if you're if you're following a posit a, a a policy of uh, not mandatory but um, education and uh, uh, incentivization, th then there is nothing wrong with uh, an incentive to to for people to be vaccinated. I don't think there's any uh, anything unethical about that. I think it's positively ethical. Um, you know, people have to still make that decision that they will um, take the incentive and get vaccinated. Um, yes, so, so I mean, this is an interesting issue. So if we start with, you know, let me call it the simple incentive. So we've seen, I don't know if you, you, you've seen in South Africa, Kenneth, I don't know what's happening where in, in your part of the world, we've had department stores. Uh, offer discounts for people who could show vaccination cards. So you, 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 you've you seen things like that. Wow. I, I, wow, I've seen... that's impressive. <laughs> uh, we, we've seen, you know, uh, I know of uh, competitions where you can only enter if you have a vaccination card and you stand to win something substantial. So let me call that the easy stuff. You can, you can do that. Uh, there's no compulsion. Then you get to some of the other issues which get a little bit more complicated. So if you look at the situation in the US at the moment, where, you know, Harry has spoken about that. If you have over 100 employees, you, you must be vaccinated. Alternatively, employers are required to test employees every week. You've, you've seen some articles where people are talking about if you're not vaccinated and you need to be tested, you're going you're to pay for that test. Um, if you need to take leave in certain circumstances, if you're not vaccinated, maybe your leave benefit will be affected and it will be unpaid leave and you know that sort of thing i think that's where you get into a little bit of the tricky space because if you start with fundamentally you're saying you can have a mandatory vaccine vaccination policy you need to respect the constitutional rights of employees you need to respect the health rights of employees so if you start with that fundamental position will some of these incentives start undermining those rights that you need to respect and i suppose you think about it, if you can align those intent, incentive schemes in a way that respects all of those positions, then instead of forcing it on people, you can perhaps do it in, a, in another way. But all I'm saying is when it comes to that sort of thing, it becomes a little bit more complicated because, uh, you know, for example, if I have a legitimate case where if you had implemented a mandatory vaccination scheme, I would have had to be excluded because of whatever religion or health yeah. whatever how do you then punish me with a weekly test as an example uh, you know that sort of thing so i think it can it can be done in certain instance in instances i think it just starts becoming complicated as it starts hitting your paycheck or when it becomes these sorts of incentives of you will now pay for the medical test i need to do every week you know yeah. those, those become issues now, delta airlines have instituted that because they've they've realized that uh being unvaccinated affected the 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 uh, medical medical scheme, 
So they've instituted that where you have to pay, I'm talking on a correction, but a, quite, a, quite a big amount monthly if you are on extra into your medical scheme on a monthly basis if you're not vaccinated. Um, but I agree with you, Mohamed. I, I, I think that's a rabbit hole that 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 should be should actually even not be on, even on the agenda. It, it, I, I would I'm personally of the opinion it should be much more a collaborative uh, discussion. Um, in more and more instances, it becomes apparent that people are not necessarily anti-vaccine, but they are not entirely informed of what exactly does it entail. So I do believe that that awareness and training and 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 uh, having an open and honest discussion with the with the with the employees is a much better approach than just uh, and that, uh, unilaterally uh, uh, mandating a, a policy. It, it will be and that leads. Sorry, go go ahead. Go on, go on, I was going to say that that sort of leads to, you know, the the concept of non-mandatory but education and and incentives. Hey. Yes. Mohamed, do you want to add? I was just going to say, I mean, Harry has started moving in that direction, is um, if you look at incentives, you need to understand what is the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. And if it's really people don't have an understanding, are scared, are fearful, I don't know how much the incentives can work. If the major problem is people are apathetic and lethargic and are just not getting up their, you know, off their butts to go and get vaccinated, maybe incentives will help. Um, yeah. so perhaps, what, what the problem is. perhaps yeah exactly and I think perhaps there's a different level of incentives that you provide so you provide uh, incentives to attend training uh, and the training will be an education process on what the risks are for so that you are helping your your employees understand um, what the risks are of vaccination or no vaccination and then on the back of that provided, you could provide an alternative incentive for staff who are prepared to uh, get vaccinated. So there, there was a, uh, to continue this a little bit further, there was a study done by UJ earlier this year, uh, testing the, the public in public willingness to get vaccinated. And I think 67% of them said definitely they will get it. 18% uh, said definitely not or not sure but 15% were totally not sure. So if we look at the flip side of incentive, if we have this, these individuals who are responsible individuals, they realize the grave threat to society and to business and all the good things that we have said now, but they also look at their health and the uncertainty and they have considered all the education and, and they, they get hooked on this, that we have developed this vaccine in a record time and it's deviating from previous approaches and they really, really are considered around their own health in that process. And whatever incentive there is cannot trump the fear that they have for this. Are there penalties for such individuals who are not irresponsible, but they have considered this for themselves as individuals. They are really uncertain and they cannot take that step. Are there penalties and are there ethical issues around those penalties? Rick, I think, I think the first issue is, you know, if, if that's the person you're describing, then the, the, the best thing we can do is the issue around education and communication and try and persuade people. If at the end of the day you, you, you can't, I think you're now getting into the, 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 the difficult trade-off that needs to make, and that's the balancing act about individual rights, individual constitutional rights versus, uh, you know, public safety and, and health. And how you you make that trade-off between between the two. Um, sorry, I just wanted to add something else. As I was um, listening to your question, I just saw something in the chat about. So, to, so does that mean? I don't know who it's directed to, but the question was: So that does that mean we we against um, mandatory vaccinations? I think the point of the discussion was not to express a view about whether we're against or for mandatory vaccinations and all i'm saying is i may have my personal view but if i look at it from a governance perspective from a leadership perspective yeah. the message is you need to apply your mind to the unique circumstances in your organization understand the risks understand the issues understand how what you think the risks are for your business and how you then as leadership would balance these competing interests in your own organization 
And what you decide for your organization may be completely different to what I may decide is appropriate for the organization I'm I'm operating in. And that's the I, I point take, I want to make. Sorry. Go on. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I'd take that one point further because, uh, I mean, what the question goes on to say is that the reality is that consensus on such sensitive issue will not uh, practically um, be achievable for all employees. And I, and I think even if you mandate, so so look at the areas where the governments have mandated, uh, and that has not resulted in 100% vaccination. Um, because there are vulnerable people, there are people who who it's not good for health-wise, uh, they may have religious issues, but there are those who simply don't believe that vaccination is the right thing. Um, and so even with a mandatory vaccination policy, you will not achieve you know, a, a full vaccination rate. Uh, and I think that needs to be recognised that, that, you know, um, e even if you had that policy, it's not going to work for everyone. And in some places, you know, people who, where they have introduced a mandatory vaccination, people haven't um, taken it up. And, and interestingly, some of them have been suspended. And that has resulted in quite considerable reputational issues uh, and cultural issues within firms. Gentlemen, we've got little time left. Can I can I shift the conversation to something that you've touched on in the beginning of the of this of this webinar, and that is around uh, risk mitigation. So what what uh, and our, because our our boards must apply their minds, as you've said, Mohammed. What risk? Uh, Mitigating strategies can risk mitigating strategies can be incorporated in the company uh, to ensure that that the employer is su uh, sufficiently protected against legal liability from the different angles that you have described. Uh, anyone wants to venture into that space? Um, I, 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 I th I'm going to change your 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 question a little bit, Frick, because there's yeah. there's so many unknowns. There's so many unknown unknowns at the moment. It's almost impossible to to be able to 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 answer you comprehensively pertaining to that. I do believe is also you need to be cognizant of the fact that this pandemic has been massively, massively disruptive, not just in South Africa but globally, and a lot of people are still scared and it has lost a lot of loved ones and and lost their jobs and all of that. So also from an from a, from an employer's perspective, you need to be kind. You need to be considerate, and 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 that's why I said the mutual respect between the employers and the employees are 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 imperative. As Kenneth mentioned, is if you do uh, unilaterally just uh, uh, decide or dictate uh, uh, either you will or you won't uh, have a mandatory policy, is is is. There's so many uh, repercussions and and subsequent waves and puddles that that emanates from that. So this is this is this this is a very fluid uh, position, and and I don't believe that we will be able to answer all the questions or the all the potential uh, uh, ramifications in a in a session of of, of just an hour. But so I will take but, if I can take yeah. what Harry's just said and roll that back to your original question Frick. Yeah. One of the key things that firms must do, whatever policy um, they uh, land upon, they absolutely must explain to all employees in some detail the, the reason for that policy, the reason behind that policy and how it will operate. So when you talk about being care and considerate to your employees, if your decision is Right, we will have this group of employees will need to be vaccinated because they have day-to-day -day contact with customers, but this group of employees do not, then you need to really explain how that's going to work and, and why that decision has been made. This is for the protection not only of you as an employee, but also our customers. Because if you're coming into contact with customers, they could give you COVID as much as you could give them COVID. So we need to protect both both of you. Over here, you have a group of employees who are maybe work in head office. They don't have any you know, um, connection with customers. There may be a different approach. It may be social distancing and it may have you know, um, screens or something like that, or you, 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 you cut up the offices in, in, in a way that reduces the flow of people or, or something. But, but those are 
different risk mitigations, the key part, but not just for reputation, not just for the culture of the firm, but 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 for your employees is to to explain it. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, Frick, if, if I can just, so can I go? Yeah, 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 please. So, so there's two issues with, to your question. So let's start and, and let's call it the operational issues. So, you know, how do you mitigate the risk? I mean, there's a lot of guidance. There's a lot of, you know, health practitioners can assist. There's issues around social distancing, changing your shift patterns, uh, work from home, all of that. that. That's at that level. The, the next issue is if I can change that question and, and apply it then to the leadership or the board of directors and say, you know, what's your liability? What's the risk you face? And, you know, what should you be doing? The, the question that always comes up is that there's so much science and information, you know, what do I follow? What do I, what do I believe? And I, I would say to, to leadership that, uh, you know, if we, if we go to the Companies Act and if you look at the business judgment through, basically what it says to you is as a leader, as a director, you have an obligation to prize yourself of the relevant information and facts. And we do this all the time with investment decisions, with, you know, whatever decisions we need to make, we get information from management and you look at competing information. You've been in a situation before where you've had two experts say different things and we've been able to make decisions around that. But you need to apply yourself diligently in terms yeah. of getting yourself up to speed as that leadership to make a decision. Yeah. And thereafter, if you have a rational basis for believing that this is in the best interest of the organization, and in fact, did believe so, then that's the decision you make. And that's the point I was making earlier, is no matter what you do, if company A does, you know, mandatory and company B does mandatory, it doesn't follow that when your conduct is questioned, the answer is the same, because each company will be looked at in terms of their particular circumstances, how they applied their mind, and was what they were doing in the best interest of the company. If you can say, if you can say that, I think it will be fine. And again, if you look at it as an, as an example, the, the letter by the CEO of Discovery, I mean, he's quite emphatic that says, we believe, you know, the law supports us, we're able to do this, and we absolutely believe that this is the right thing to do. Um, it, it suggests that having considered all of the competing information, competing rights, so on, that you then as a as leadership apply yourself and come to a decision. And no, no one can help you with that decision, unfortunately. It's every organization will need to make that decision for themselves. That's yeah, what, what, absolutely what, right. Uh, Muhammad, so that's board, our on point. I agree. So, so the last the thing I want to add... Have the information. The board yeah. needs to have the information to be able to make that decision. It's got to undertake that risk assessment. Yes. Yeah. So, so the point I was making with the business judgment rule, so if in that scenario, let's say there's something happens and, and, and the leadership of the board is sued by a party in, in whatever circumstances, that is what is the defense to any sort of claim against directors as to whether they fulfill their duties or not. It's not whether you implemented a policy or not regardless of what policy you implemented, but is your decision linked to that process or the governance thinking that I'm describing? And that is your defense ultimately, and that's how you, you uh, mitigate your risk. Yeah. So, so what I gathered from your, from, your, from your answers here is that this is really unexplored territory. Uh, you, you, can, you do can do all of these assessments and you can do take guidance, but you don't have a formula out there. There's no right and wrong here. You will just have to be diligent in the application of your mind. Uh, and not everybody is going to agree with what decision you make. Yeah, that's right? true. You know that, but, but as long as you have, as long as you have done the right preparation and given it the appropriate amount of consideration, then, you know, you can feel that you have done your best uh, and, and you should, as you know, as Mohammed says, you should be protected. Gentlemen, we have ran out of time. I want to allow each of you maybe just one minute of last words of wisdom that you want to share with our audience. Anybody want to start that? Um, I, I, I think I've said everything I have to say. Uh, I think that, you know, risk assessment and, and due consideration, um, it's not one size fits all. Um, and, you know, if you want to protect the firm's reputation, you must consider the protection of your customers and your employees. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I think I've also sort of put across the message I wanted to get across a few times, and that is about, if you look at leadership and governance, it's about mindful application, it's about good judgment, and, and making the decisions. And you can't get into an analysis paralysis just because it's extremely difficult. Yeah. In, in, in conclusion, I just wanted to say, I, I wanted to mention it earlier, I found interesting in preparing for the session, I actually found, I don't know how long ago it was, that there's a decision in the in the US about a mandatory vaccination a position being upheld, and that related to smallpox. If you look at India, they have a mandatory vaccinations act also previously dealing with, with smallpox. So some of these dilemmas we think are new, they've, they've existed and been dealt with in the past, which is quite interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Harry? seems to be the last word to you. Um, thank you very much, Frick, and thank you very much for the panelists to make uh, time available as well as your very insightful and very, very thought-provoking comments. It's, it's, we really do appreciate it. Is um, Frick, um, I'm sure through the uh, Stellenbosch Graduate Institute, is we'll make our slides available for distribution. And um, just on, on that is, is we would like to thank the Stellenbosch Graduate Institute as well for for arranging this session and I think it's been very valuable. But last but not least is, is as uh, Muhammad and as Kenneth said, is I think at least uh, uh, go through the risk assessment um, and, and, and get get the relevant information. Don't just assume and don't please don't don't follow the social media and make based your decisions on that. You need to apply your mind diligently and, and, and then based on on, on, on your on your information, then by, by make a make an information uh, an informed decision. Of course, there's there's so many, and yet again, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's a it's a it's such a fluid topic, and and I don't believe that that uh, that that you'll be able to answer or come to a decision in a blink of an eye. And, and that's it from my side. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate. Thank you for sharing your insight with us. I said to you in the in the in the in the conversations beforehand that uh, we start with doubt and we end with informed doubt, and that is kind of the sense that I get around this topic to our audience. I hope you've enjoyed it. We will be in contact with you soon where you can get the recording of this and the slides and also when our next session is. Gentlemen, audience, thank you. See you thank later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Bye -bye. much.